Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Courtney Doggart, and I'm the president of Network 2020. It's a real pleasure today to pull together a panel on cyber conflict, which is something that we've long wanted to do, and we're actually trying to schedule for sometime at the end of March, and then, uh, and then coronavirus hit and everything changed. So um, we're really actually quite glad to be able to do this virtually. Um, Right now, I am going to turn it over in a moment to our panelists and our moderator. But first, I'm going to go through their bios. And just so everyone who's listening knows, I did have permission to shorten their bios. Um, needless to say, you have really tremendous experience on the today. And to go through it all um, would probably take the full hour. So I'd rather not do that. Um, so I'll start with Ambassador Payanovic Jurisic. Uh, she is the permanent representative of Montenegro to the UN as of May 2018. Uh, prior to that, she served as the Minister of Defense in the government of Montenegro from 2012 to 2016. And that was a very key time in Montenegro's development, including NATO accession. Uh, she is a member of the governance board of the Atlantic Council of Montenegro and the founder of its digital forensic lab. She has a PhD in telecommunication engineering as well. And I will stop there for the rest of the bios on the website. We also have uh, retired Major General Brett Williams, um, and he is the uh, co-founder and chief operating officer of cybersecurity, uh, which delivers the power of companies, sectors, and nations. Prior to that, he served in, uh, as an Air Force General Officer and served for senior executive leadership positions. And as the Director of Operations at U.S. Cyber Command, he led a team of 400 people responsible for the global operations and defense of all DOD networks, as well as the planning and execution of authorized offensive operations. Um, his, the rest of the bio is quite long, so again, I will direct you to the website. Uh, we also have Jay Healy. He is a senior research scholar at Columbia University School for International and Public Affairs, and he specializes in cyber conflict, competition, and cooperation. Prior to this, he was the founding director of the Cyber Statecraft Initiative of the Atlantic Council, where he remains a senior fellow. He is the editor of the first history of conflict in cyberspace and is a frequent topic on those issues. Um, he has also... Uh, served as the Vice Chair of the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center and is on the review board of CON and Black Hat, Black Hat Hacker Conferences and served on the Defense Science Board Task Force on Cyber Deterrence. Um, our moderator is Tom Yohannan, who leads business development for the Digital DNA Group, a digital forensics lab that is part of Cyber NYC's Cyber Startup Radar 2020. He also serves as a security advisor to the U.S.-Israel Economic Mission contributing for cyber crime and security, focusing on cyber insurance. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn it over to Tom, who will be moderating the discussion. If at any point you have a question, please do put it in the Q&A box. And I believe Brian has also just sent instructions for asking questions. Um, and with that, um, Tom, over to you. Thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Courtney. Doggart, thank you so much for your leadership in this network, uh, in this organization, Network 2020. Um, despite this fact that we'll be speaking about international cyber conflict, I just wanted to uh, take some time and just to have a few observations. One is just kind of the, you know, this human tra tragedy that we're going through, um, this cruel and merciless pandemic that spreads illness, you know, social and economic trauma. Um, you know, I always feel that thoughts and prayers are not enough, but uh, you know, I'm thankful for all our first responders and, you know, for anyone that's been affected, please, uh, we, pray, we do pray for you. And so um, thank you for that. Uh, when it comes to our government, you know, as a U.S. citizen, I'm thankful for you know, federalism in, in, in our political system. Um, I hope we can create a more legitimate answer to any future pandemics that we, uh, we encounter. Uh, and then finally, you know, I don't know where American leadership is going to go, and I hope the panel can can answer those questions. Um, I'm hoping that it's an opportunity as opposed to a vulnerability. Um, but you know, I have a lot more questions than answers, and so uh, with that, I wanted to kind of you know 
go to the, the panel today. Um, I can't imagine three more brilliant people that could talk on the issue of international cyber conflict. Um, you know, and first off, I wanted to uh, send it over to Melissa. Uh, she is the permanent representative to the UN uh, for Montenegro. And uh, most people probably don't understand that you know, Montenegro for the past few years has been a leader in cyber intelligence and network operations. And so, um, you know, Melitza, when we speak about international cyber conflict, um, there's so many ideas to unpack, and I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on that. But, you know, I guess can you table set how you see it from a European, uh, a Baltic state uh, perspective. No, you don't want no to. Baltic. <laughs> okay. No Baltic state. Oh, oh sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, from, a, from a European perspective, um, you know, coming threats from Asia, uh, threats from the East in, in terms of Russia, and then also threats from the South. I mean, uh, go into a little bit about what you see as cyber conflict or cyber peace um, as you're dealing with the UN as well. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, let me thank Network 2020 for this opportunity. And I want to join your comments on uh, uh, expressing um, our appreciation for everyone who is working so hard in these very difficult times to make our lives as normal as possible, if there is any normal nowadays. Uh, anyway, what I want to just say right today is the World Telecommunication and Information Society Day. So um, International Telecommunications Union as an agency of the United Nations is um, uh, in a way very much engaged in everything which has to do with the ICTs and uh, it's the way how we actually harness everything related with the ICTs in the UN system and globally. So during the day today, we've been, I mean, European time, of course, the day is almost at its end. We've been um, having a number of panel discussions on um, ICTs and on the fact that actually we are all very much aware of all the benefits we are having from that part of our activities, starting from all main pillars of UN, which are first of all, peace and security, then human rights and then sustainable development. But on the other side, being very much aware of all risks and all uses of ICTs which haven't meant to be. So from that point, Jason knows that uh, in UN, I've been very much involved in the work of the open-ended working group, which is the new forum established uh, within the United Nations, where we are trying to give some better answers in um, what is the role of ICTs in preserving international security and peace. It's not an easy task. It's fairly complicated. It's complex. We are somewhere at the finishing phase with the report that should be uh, agreed by this summer in that huge multilateral forum as United Nations are. That's uh, not an easy task. But what is very important from my point of view is that the issue of uh, uh, ICTs uh, as a um, mean for uh, actually preserving international security and peace and for uh, preserving each and everyone from the malicious uh, use of the same technologies is on the table in the UN. And uh, what is even more important, for example, is that in a couple of days on 22nd of May, there will be for the first time a discussion on cybersecurity within the UN Security Council. That is, of course, thanks to the Baltic country, Estonia. So Estonia is a Baltic country, which is now presiding uh, Security Council. And they managed to put that in agenda of the Security Council for this month. That is something which is really huge. Maybe people who are outside the UN don't see it like that, but I believe it's huge. And it helps to every and each of one. Uh, as you said, Montenegro is having very specific experiences, very important experiences, even very successful ones, because unfortunately, 
uh, in that phase, which is related with um, Montenegro becoming a NATO uh, member, we've been exposed to so uh, many different um, uh, cyber attacks, which were from the non-state actors or proxies of the state actors. And the aim was quite clear. It was to undermine our strategic priorities and um, we were first on our own in trying to find the responses to this kind of behavior. But later on, as our partners, as the first place partners in NATO realized what was happening, it was very important that we did have that synergy of the joint activities without, uh, within the NATO alliance and that our experiences uh, helped a lot to other our partners, including the United, including United States, to see, to learn what um, has been coming from different uh, places, as you saw from East, and how all this was used in um, a way to actually influence the unity, the solidarity, the joint response that might be going from this multilateral forum. So from that point, uh, we were willing at every point to uh, share uh, what we saw, what we experienced, to suggest the solutions to the others. And that is something I'm doing uh, at the moment within this UN forum, trying to actually um, make the awareness of what is our experience more visible and be a part of all these efforts we are having together. Yeah, it's interesting when you speak about the, the UN and, you know, Jay, you know, I know you spoke in the past on deterrence or as you might, or as your colleague called it, restraint, you know, and one of the, one of the, uh, the quotes that I really appreciate about you being that you're a historian in this subject matter, um, the more strategically significant the cyber conflict, the more similar it is to conflicts in other domains. Mm. So when you look at this pandemic and the history of pandemics and also conflict, like where do you see this going, you know, in terms of international and national cyber conflict? Is there deterrence? Is it um, kind of like what happened today with Trump's emails, which is um, are there smaller actors that are not state actors that will be uh, attacking during times of national vulnerabilities? Yeah, one of the things, great, great, thanks, Tom. Uh, one of the things that's been affecting not just cyber conflict, but also pandemic response has been the, the general breakdown in global governance over the last, oh, call it 10 years. You might be able to go back 15 years, um, where it's just harder to do things on the global scale. It's harder to get global agreement. It's harder to, to make... Um, uh, the progress, and again, that's, and that's affecting us all across a lot of areas. One of my colleagues here at Columbia University, Tom Christensen, said regarding the pandemic, um, you know, other than maybe an alien invasion, this is something that is affecting all of humanity, and you can, and if we were ever going to come together as on a on a globe together on a single issue boy, it seems like this would be it other than like alien invasion that might actually bring us all together. And of course, we, you know, we, we haven't seen that happen as, uh, to the degree that we might hope. So what um, I was trying to get at in the quote that, that you just said, Tom, right? I mean, that you can learn a lot from what's going on on cyber um, by looking at the overall ge geopolitics. So we might have hoped um, that this common existential calamity, you know, that all states are having this existential moment simultaneously, right? It's hard to imagine any other catastrophe or war that we've had that is affecting every country to an existential degree at the same time. Not even the world wars um, hit us to the same degree. And so um, it's not bringing us closer together um, in geopolitics or in cyber. So we're gonna be seeing just more of the same trends. Um, just last, and actually I would like to call out here the open-ended working group that the ambassador brought up. Mm -hmm. um, this is many, many nations at the United Nations coming together, putting forth their proposals, listening, speaking, um, compromising. 
Um, and there's a good piece that came out up on the Council on Foreign Relations um, just a couple of weeks ago on, on May 4th by Josh Gold. So that's the Council on Foreign Relations Net Politics blog, where he calls out some of the great work by the open-ended working group on COVID-related norms. Um, and, and he summarizes some of the work that, that had happened there. Um, I'll point out just, I think it was uh, one week ago, the United States, the FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security of the cyber arm called CISA, called out Chinese cyber espionage, uh, COVID-related cyber espionage, saying, hey, they're going after, they're trying to steal intellectual property, and this is endangering health and life and is going to hurt our ability to, to deliver solutions. Um, now, many of the people that are, that are following this will certainly be familiar with the, with the common U.S. and other complaints by other countries about Chinese theft of intellectual property. But to me, I was very disappointed that the U.S. government, well, I was pleased that they called out the Chinese behavior, but they didn't say they were, this was the Chinese up to their old game and trying to steal intellectual property. They said it's threatening life and safety, which I thought was going a little bit too far. Um, we can't, we do need these cyber norms. We need do need to try and pull back the intensity of cyber conflict, especially as it relates to the pandemic. So I wish the FBI and DHS, instead of saying um, that this espionage hurts, um, you know, could cause life safety issues, they would have said, here's a list of new COVID related norms that we think we should pursue um, and root them in the existing norms um, that the UN, the G20, and others have been doing. Because certainly the United States is doing a ton of COVID-related espionage. Of course, the CIA and NSA are getting deep into the Wuhan labs, or get labs, are getting deep into trying to figure out if what the Chinese Communist Party or the Russia, or what Russia and Putin are saying, um, where the mismatches between those pronouncements and the reality is. Um, of course, states are gonna be trying to find out what is happening with vaccines and if what different states are publishing in the medical literature is actually reflecting what's happened in their own states. So a norm based on don't do espionage strikes me as, as um, disingenuous. Um, rather, let's say absolutely you cannot be doing ransomware attacks against hospitals. The EU has come out against that, the Dutch, a few others, it's been in, the, it's been in quite a bit of the open-ended working group. Um, say, look, espionage, you're not going to be able to do limits on, but espionage, you know, against hospitals, right? That's, they've got other things to do. That's worth the point of service. And let's maybe, uh, and that should only be done um, in extraordinarily circumstances, not just in routine circumstances. There's a number of these that we can hit so that we can try and get through this moment with better norms than we came into it. Next talk. Got it. No, so just following up on that. So when you speak on norms, and, and I guess when you look at a national regulation or international uh, policy, how do you, I guess this is the problem with security, which is when you don't have a body count or when you don't have an economic number, how do you assign value to cyberspace? Well, you so, don't have to, right? I mean, you're not, we don't say that you shouldn't bomb hospitals, right? The, the Geneva Convention didn't, didn't specify that, um, you know, you shouldn't attack objects marked with a, with a red cross or a red crescent because it's, it, it, it's not economically smart, right? No, they say it's a travesty. It's an, it's an atrocity and you shouldn't do it. Um, and so there's still some countries, especially, um, uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be particularly picking on China or Russia. I'm more than happy to pick on the United States and, and, and some, of the, some of our behaviors that I think have been less than stabilizing over the years. Um, the, but there is a difference in like the United States and like-minded countries in Europe and, and Australia, New Zealand, and Japan have said existing international law like the Geneva Convention does apply in cyberspace and therefore you don't do things like attack hospitals. Well, not different than espionage, but you don't attack hospitals. Got it, got it. Um, in the UN processes, China and some other countries have said, no, 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 there's no international law that applies to the space, which again, when you're in a pandemic, is not helpful um, to be there. And the, just to close off on norms, um, I found that a lot of my colleagues um, uh, in cyber tend to talk about norms um, and uh, 
whereas I found a lot when I talked to the national security scholars, they tend to say guardrails. And boy, I like the idea of guardrails better than norms. Like norms almost implies, well, the self-restraint that we have to show. Guardrail certainly implies a more <laughs> like this physical restraint, right? And these things that are gonna really bound you in different ways, more than just agreements. And it's, maybe it's just a turn of phrase, but it's one that I find quite helpful. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you so much, Jay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, turning over to Brett, I mean, you know, would love to hear more from what your thoughts are on, you know, national security, being that you were, you know, a major general in the Air Force, but also uh, from the corporate side. You know, I, I, you know, Brett, for those that don't know, Brett and I uh, wrote an article recently on how the GC should be leading uh, the security group within organizations. And so one of the things that I was curious about with you, Brett, um, being that you're on the National Association of Corporate Directors Board, um, how do you see, you know, the response from organizations or what can you tell us about how organizations are looking at cyberspace on a national and obviously, you know, larger companies, international level? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, you know, I guess I'll start at what I would call um, the, for me, what I would define as the strategic level and then just take it down a couple of steps to what, uh, what you're talking about with how businesses uh, are thinking about this and, and how it crosses international boundaries. You know, one of the things that I figured out at um, working at Cyber Command was that, uh, to me, there's no such thing as, as cyber war. Uh, for those that are familiar with the uh, the Prussian war theorist Clausewitz, uh, I think some of the things he he wrote about are still valid. And one of them is that the nature of war is enduring and its character changes. That's a paraphrase. But basically, the fact that that nation states are willing to spill blood and treasure because they have opposing objectives and they have opposing ideals has not changed. But the character of war changes. And um, and Jay on our pre-call had some great analogies to to air power and and. Uh, that's one I think about a lot is, you know, we introduced the airplane into warfare uh, just about 100 years ago, and there was a lot of predictions about what that would do. Um, you know, the, uh, a theorist called, uh, named Duhay said we would poison bomb uh, Paris. We would never have a reason for ground armies, and, and we would defeat everybody from the air. And then the Germans bombed London and the Blitz in 1940, and guess what? They didn't give up. And so, so now we've got 100 years of trying to figure out what are the implications of being able to operate in the air domain on, on nation state conflict? And I would argue we still don't have a complete theory of air power. And what that did was it compressed time, space, and distance. You know, it changed the character of war. Now, if we look at, at cyber conflict, and I like that term the way Jason uses it, the ability to conduct operations or project power in and through cyberspace, we compress time, space, and distance maybe now a hundredfold. And it does some other things. Uh, to your point, it, it means no more away games, right? For the US in particular, we like to fight away games. But now those companies you're talking about, especially the ones that manage critical infrastructure, the ones that uh, operate healthcare, finance, water, telecommunications, transportation, all of those have become really on the front lines if we get into some kind of a nation state conflict, particularly with a very powerful actor in cyberspace like China, Russia, et cetera. And so we have to, and one of the things I worked with business leaders was to get them to understand that this isn't just a business issue. It's, a, it's an issue of, of national security and like it or not, they become, they become part of that, that apparatus. And so, so I think keeping this context of there's not a cyber war because people that I think gravitate to cyber war get sometimes myopic and that if it happened in cyberspace, I've got to respond in cyberspace when actually we have a lot of other elements of national power. And just like we don't fight a war with just an Air Force or a Navy, it's bringing together all those elements of power that really make a difference. Uh, and then just quickly, the two points that follow on to that for me that uh, kind of came up in the discussion already was, was that we've got to think about what are the roles of, of attack versus defense. You know, there's a lot of things, you know, companies, there's been these discussions of hacking back and what's the role of government, what's the role of the private sector, et cetera. And I think understanding alliances, collective defense, all of those things that we apply to warfare, we've got to think about how does the character of warfare change due to cyberspace and how does that vary our thinking. I was actually surprised at the ambassador when she said this is the first UN cyber 
to you in discussion at this at the national <clears throat> at that level council. the security council level on cybersecurity. Um, you know, I continue to be disappointed and I don't think I can be disappointed anymore at some of the lack of top level conversations on this, but the fact that that's the first one that that had not occurred to me. And then I guess the last thing is is the other thing that this this cyber domain brings in is is even more than air operations, the ability for collateral damage and the ability for people that really aren't directly part of the conflict to have an impact. Um, you know, a quick example would be after the, the Sony uh, hack by North Korea, uh, there was some kind of activity in North Korea against their internet. And, you know, was that the government? Was that uh, anonymous? You know, who was that? And being able to, from a security, national security policy, being able to manage all of those other impacts and cascading effects that this domain produces, I think, makes it challenging. So, so the point is, uh, to wrap this up, is we're going to remain in conflict. Uh, we're going to remain in a strategic competition. Uh, cyberspace has, has offered new domains, but it brings in a lot of other players. And certainly at the, uh, the highest levels of business, uh, it is something that has to be considered. Got it, got it. So when it, when it comes to you know, national security, how do you see the U.S.? I mean, one of the things that you said in the past was um, if you're looking for a technology solution, uh, as a business leader, well, you're not going to find it because that, that solution is going to be obsolete three months from now. So if you're looking at, you know, Cyber Command or some of these other initiatives that the U.S. government has done, like how do you see their place in the world or what should, be, should the government be doing to advance their place in the world? The U.S. government, I should say. Yeah, at the risk of being very blunt and, and pejorative, I just feel like that uh, that the United States has been ex extremely slow to decide how operations in cyberspace fit into our, our national security policy. And, and it's not just national defense, it's national security. Uh, you know, I think Russia, I think China, I think North Korea, I think Iran, I think they've all decided how they're going to use activity in cyberspace to further their national strategic goals. Yet we seem to, you know, halt and lurch at being able to to decide uh, how we're going to use operations in cyberspace, whether it has to do with, uh, <clears throat> you know, how we frame espionage. Uh, are we willing to conduct operations in, you know, what we refer to as as red space to preposition ourselves? Uh, it's establishing of norms or guardrails, as Jason talked to. It's about bringing it into the conversation of of how does it fit into our NATO alliance? Uh, you know, who is going to have what roles? How much information are we gonna share? Those sorts of things. And then when you bring it down, you know, internally at the national level is, is what is the coordination gonna be between the public and private sector? If the private sector really is on the front lines of, of, of this conflict in cyberspace, how are we gonna get better at collaborating, at sharing information, creating an environment where business is not worried about as much about liability and then they see that there is great benefit to sharing information and being able to create a collective defense that that comes out of that public private sharing so i think all of those are aspects that i don't feel like we've we've defined well and it's you know in, in almost everything else uh, you know for the last at least 100 years the u.s maybe i'm overstating i'm not an academic but let's say since world war ii we tend to drive a lot of precedent and I think right now we're letting a lot of other people drive the precedent in cyberspace. And, and I would like to see us take a more uh, direct leadership role in a lot of those areas. If I, if I can jump in on that, Tom, you know, I, I mostly agree, but partially disagree with it. Where I, where I, where I'll, I'll take the disagreement first. Um, you know, the United States were predator long before we were prey, right? I mean, this was the golden age of espionage, right? The, um, whether that lead was, um, you know, the internet was created here. We baked our values into it, right? It's largely California values that, 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 that are the internet. Um, because the submarine uh, um, cable landing stations were all in the United States um, or predominantly or significantly in the United States, the um, key internet infrastructure, like internet exchange points, like in the early internet, there were only two, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. Um, and U.S. intelligence took more than advantage of, of um, that physical and internet geography. Um, we were very happy um, to be able to, to spy to significant de degrees. And when other countries said, well, that's not the norm. You shouldn't be able to do this widespread 
um, espionage. We said, you know what, go cry somewhere else. This is espionage. This is the way it happened, right? It was 10 years ago with Snowden. And we said, boo-hoo-hoo, go away. This is espionage. Until the Chinese hacked OPM, the, um, the USHR agency. Then all of a sudden we said, this is intolerable. These, these our adversaries know no norms and they blow right through. Even though we had just years earlier um, told the Europeans to go, to go, um, to go cry in a river. Um, so we were predators before we were prey. We did the first infrastructure attack, the industrial control system attack um, against Iran, right? So um, there's a good sense in the United States, um, uh, within the Beltway in Washington, D.C., that the norms are being set by others, um, which is a very selective reading uh, of history. Um, the U.S. doesn't do things like WannaCry or NotPetya or attack private companies like Sony or steal for intellectual property. And I'm really glad about that. Um, but we have to look at, if we want to understand the dynamics, we've got to understand the who's doing what to whom. Um, where I do agree with the general very, very strongly is when I think about the differences between um, normal conflict and conflict in cyberspace. Um, well, a lot, especially in the military, they hint at what the, or, the biggest difference, I think, to a lot of my military colleagues and, and um, Brett alluded to the speed, right? A lot of my military colleagues will say, well, it's speed of light, it's network speed, and they focus on that as the primary dynamic and what distinguishes cyber conflict. Um, I like what um, Brett mentioned second, which was the role of the private sector, at least in OECD countries, like the, Uni like the United States. Um, the biggest difference to me, and the difference, biggest difference from Clausewitz, how saw war, um, is the role of the private sector, right? In every other kind of war, the pr civilians, the private sector, try to get away from the battlefield. In cyber, the private sector networks are the battlefield. As soon as um, the Air Force in, in cyberspace is wheels up, right and starting to fly out they're flying through networks built by private sector companies for their own purposes and using their own money but overwhelmingly not not entirely but overwhelmingly it's a tremendous tremendous difference and on the defense oh and the euphemism that the the military uses for this is calling it gray space right there's red space which is like the arsons and the chinese networks there's blue space which is our networks and then there's gray space which is all the other stuff Gray space is a euphemism for other people's private property, right? Um, overwhelming uh, or sub substantially, I'll say. What this means on the defense is that in general, the private sector is the supported command, right? This is a military concept, right? If there was a war in Europe, then um, U European, U.S. European command would be the supported command and everyone else is the supporting command. In general, especially for rich countries, um, and unlike Russia, China, Iran, the countries that um, the general mentioned like have, were able to solve this easily, for us, the private sector is the supporting command. And generally, it's the government that has to support the private sector because they're on the front line. Wonderful. Ambassador, I mean, so I guess going from an outsider's perspective, how do you see U.S. national security? What are we, you know, what are some of our vulnerabilities or opportunities uh, when it comes to leadership in, in this space, uh, not only in cyberspace, but in the real world as well. Um, you know, and it could be from a personal perspective, an EU perspective. What are your thoughts? Well, actually, it's difficult to say since I'm ambassador. But anyway, ambassador in UN, where yeah. we are um, trying to find consensus on whatever we are um, working on and uh, at this right moment really we are working very hard on reaching the consensus of the report of the open-ended working group and um, there it's very important that everything we've done in the last year was done in the uh, very close cooperation with the private sector that is something which is fairly new for the united nations i mean you might be disappointed or not that there are things which are for the first time going on in UN, but that's the fact. Uh, and the, actually, 
that we succeeded to bring all these uh, different stakeholders. You would uh, listen to all these people coming from different parts of UN talking all the time about multi-stakeholder approach and the things like that. But I've got to say that uh, it's not that common there. But when we were working on these things, there were a group of countries, uh, among them US as well, which were very firm on that necessity to have really different stakeholders and among them at the first place, private sector. Of course, academia, NGOs, all of them were there, but private sector, as Jason said, it's because of the nature of networking. I mean, it's something you just can't oversee and say, okay, we'll see it later. No, no, they are the main actor there. And that's why we were working very closely with them. I do believe that um, in these last two months, we will be able to upgrade the, that report we are preparing by everything we lived in these last two months with pandemia. Because actually what happened with all these measures which were taken, uh, called social or physical distancing, whatever, is that everyone individually turned towards um, all these different uh, digital means to not be cut off. So from that point, what was obvious, uh, again, was that, again, it was very difficult, it was so challenging, but there were people who were using the situation for doing all these different kind of cyber attacks, cyber threats, as already mentioned to the hospitals, but to individuals as well. Uh, tech companies found out that it was a kind of a growth of 300% of all these different phishing attacks. And imagine all these people who are now online, who are not uh, uh, very much, I would say, uh, having a lot of knowledge about, they're doing that for the first time. They are so easy targets. And that's why I do believe that whatever we are doing in cybersecurity, we've got uh, to put the stress now, okay, companies, organization, that is something we're already doing, but we've got to add that human-centric approach. So it's every individual who is exposed to all these kind of things. And you know, when we are talking about conflicts, that's how you are building the atmosphere for the conflict. That's how you are building that cascading effect that could lead to different uh, conflicts. We are living that in this region of Western Balkans, for example. And recently we've been doing our digital forensic lab was a part of a big project done within NATO about all these narratives, disinformation, fake information, whatever you call them, the people here are exposed to. So I will give you a couple of examples. For example, what is this narrative about? It's like, say, uh, Western Balkans uh, has always been unstable and it's a fantastic place with a high risk of conflict. The European Union can't be a kind of uh, project which is giving incentives to the uh, Western Balkan region. It's a kind of uh, project which is uh, characterized with the um, hegemonian's aspirations. Uh, the countries of Western Balkans all are very weak, they are corrupt, uh, human rights are at stake there, NATO membership is something which only costs you, you don't have any benefits of that. It's all this uh, narrative which is so much pushed forward that it's creating the atmosphere for later on to do whatever you would like to do in the uh, form of uh, different, uh, I would say, not just undermining your democratic development further on, but also putting you in a, in a conflict with uh, some of the other countries. And that's why I do believe that uh, when we are talking about these uh, cyber conflicts and the risks of cyber conflicts, we've got to think about uh, the real way how we could cope with these narratives. It's not an easy thing because, you know, uh, before this was uh, considered just as a kind of a side effect uh, when you are talking about trust in information or as they would say in military information assurance and cyber defense. But nowadays, with these attempts to influence the way how the population is thinking, to confuse the population, 
that is something we are living also now with COVID all these conspiracy theories. I was so stunned when I saw some people I could uh, always uh, think about like very rational ones, uh, like informed ones, talking about, uh, I don't know, you know, 5G, all these uh, laboratory viruses and the things like that, being so convinced with no real arguments. That is something we've got to cope with. And that is why I do think that actually uh, multilateral organizations, NATO, then United Nations also has to talk about and to see how we could prevent those kind of bad uh, consequences and how to actually fight this kind of behavior we are all personally exposed to. That is important and that is why uh, we will try now through the, this last part of the open-ended working group in uh, United Nations to uh, update the prepared report in that sense, to actually learn the lessons from these last two months and see how that learned lessons could help us in whatever is coming next. Okay. Thank you, um, and sorry for all the mistakes. Uh, what, I do have a question from the audience, and this is an uh, open forum. It was mentioned how the private sector is now in the middle of the cyber battleground. What is the best strategy for the United States and its allies to combat authoritarian states where often the government and commercial sector are one and the same actor? Yeah, yeah I'll jump on that real quick, Tom. Um, you know, my initial thought is it kind of goes back to um, you know, warfare has been around a long time. It's, it's, you know, I'm glad when we concluded that the whole democratic uh, hacking wasn't really a hack. It was just an extension of, of information warfare and, again, using cyberspace to do it more effectively. I mean, we've dealt with uh, all sorts of countries that, that again, it kind of goes back to Jason's point where we, I would call it whining. We whine about unfair competition because the nature of that country is it does have that connection between the, the private sector and the public sector in, in a way we don't have nor do we want but we are not going to establish norms for them uh you know that that break that to me we've got to figure out how to compete better um i would say you know that you saw some of this in brexit some of the reason the uk was was very adamant about leaving was what they perceived as uh, unfair competition uh from some of the other eu nations about uh uh particularly um commerce uh, space uh uh, airplanes, uh, you know, a variety of things like that. And so to me, again, it's, it, it's nothing new. The fact that we don't collaborate that same way, um, we aren't going to change the way other people operate. I just think we've got to figure out how to deal with that more effectively. Jay, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, part of my initial answer on the, you know, I mean, for me, the strategy is, and, the, and let me cover both the general points here as well as previous points um and say like what my strategy would be right it's easy it's easy to criticize um one of the things that has struck me um when i did that history of cyber conflict that that uh, book that courtney had mentioned in the in introduction i came across this great quote it was actually from a from a from an air force lieutenant colonel um brett, brett and i both have backgrounds in the air force and this air force lieutenant colonel said few if any contemporary security controls can stop a dedicated red team from easily accessing any information sought a, a red team i think many many of the the network 2020 folks will know that's when you pay a friendly hacker to try and test your systems to see if they can get in like they pretend they're an adversary and they see if they can break in so, so this was saying that it's exceptionally easy for the for that red team to get in what this means is that the attacker has the advantage, right? The offense has an easier time than the defense. Um, and this is a pretty common thing. I mean, we all know this within, uh, within computer security. What we don't know is that, that quote was from 1979. So for 40 years, the attacker has had the advantage. So when I see these new DO, Department of Defense strategies or DHS strategies or Salarian commissions or national strategies, none of them actually get to change this central point, right? I don't know why anyone listens to us cybersecurity experts. 
because we've been telling stuff for people do X, Y, and Z for 40 years. We've spent hundreds of billions of dollars. We've done thousands of patents. We've had missed kids' birthdays, worked weekends, um, all of these disasters, and they all tend to hit on Friday afternoons. And yet we haven't changed the fundamental fact that the attacker has the advantage. Um, the one part in, in particular is because the US government doesn't particularly want to flip that around necessarily, right? We like the advantages that come from being able to do a lot of espionage. We like being able to give the president additional options to take down, for example, air defenses in Iran without having to kill anybody um, by using cyber means. Um, so I would, all of my strategies around, well, what can we do to try and get the defense better than the offense? If we can do that, that really stabilizes the situation. And the U and it's one of the things that I think the U.S. could really, could really show leadership in. Um, too often, when we're having the conversation about cyber conflict, we simplify it to an us and them. We take these points about, for example, Clausewitz. I mean, I'm not saying the general's doing this, right? And we make it as if this is the most important aspect. And we forget that the internet is the most transformative technology that's come from human minds, like maybe literally since Gutenberg, right? In hundreds and hundreds of years, this is the coolest invention and the one that's changed our trajectory for the most and for the best. And so we have to keep in mind when we talk about cyber conflict is not to just come back and imagine that the primary reason of the internet is that, right? And frankly, in our lifetime, certainly in the lifetime of our kids or grandkids, the internet might even surpass Gutenberg. It might be the best, trans most tran transformative thing from human mind since the fire and wheel. Um, without exaggeration, <laughs> right? Or only maybe a little bit of exaggeration. And so I really say, what can we do to make sure the internet is sustainable? so that our grandkids, when they're our age, has an internet that's at least as open, secure, resilient as the one that we have today. Mm -hmm. And that's where I really try and base is my thinking in, in, in this space. And, and I got to thank you know, all the folks that are, you know, my fellow panelists for all they've done to try and work and, and make it so. Got it, got it. Yeah, I would uh, just, if I, yeah, if I could, I mean, I, Jason and I are aligned on, on just about all of these points and, to the ambassador's point about, you know, all the people coming on here, you know, not to plug his book, I'm, Nick, I'm as far as I know, I'm getting no cut of the royalties, but it was uh, when I first got into the cyber business about 10 years ago, that was one of the first books I read, that and another one uh, called Worm, that that both emphasized to me that point he just made, that, that the dynamics of this have been the same since it started, right? And uh, to me, that, you know, there's multiple aspects of deterrence, but one, one part of deterrence is, is raise the cost to the attacker. And I think that it has to be done on the defensive side. We've got to make it, you know, you got to make yourself a harder target. It's got to be more expensive for them to achieve success. And that's really hard to do. Uh, and a lot of times it's, it's just like the old bear joke. I don't have to run faster than the bear. I just got to run faster than you. So how can I make myself a harder target uh, than the next guy? And I think uh, that's a good approach for companies to take. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, you know, one thing that the ambassador brought up was kind of uh, changing the mindset of populations, whether that's through social media or through what we term fake news. You know, one of the questions um, that has been asked is what are the steps that the U.S. has taken since 2016 to prevent election and interference in the upcoming election? You know, the upcoming election is obviously the president is up for election, a third of the Senate. Um, all of the House, a lot of state and local governments. So you have layers of this government that is up for election or up for, uh, for influence, I should say. And so, you know, what are the steps that we have taken or what steps should we take? Uh, that's not only from an internal, but also an international uh, aspect. Uh, will this problem be better or worse with more people opting to vote by mail-in ballot as well? Jason, Ambassador, or, or Brett, open forum. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll just start, and I'm, and I'm curious how, uh, you know, Europe is looking at this and, and the issues in, in Montenegro also. Um, the, it's one of the things that, when I, when I look at this, the, um, I've read a book, you know, as information and influence has started to become more of a thing, 
Um, that's how military doctrine in the US was focused in the 90s of treating all of this together, right? Hacking and information were together and then we split it apart. So after 2016, I decided I was gonna dive into this and go back to some of the books that were influential and the authors influential to me, including books by um, Alvin and Heidi Toffler. Now their names aren't so well known, but so they were some of the original futurists that were writing and saying, well, how are these new, what are the new technological trends and how they affect us? They wrote books like The Third Wave and one called Future Shock, which argued that the accelerating pace of technological change will hit us as this profound and real psychological shock that people will, uh, some uh, parts of society will respond very well. We now know those are like cities um, to this change and be able to adapt. Uh, and others are not gonna be able to adapt at all. And they're gonna feel like foreigners in their own culture as they see society accelerate, accelerate away with them with this pace of new technological change. Um, and Alvin Toffler wrote that, so therefore we either need to slow down the pace of technological change or we have to increase our ability to adapt. Now that sounds like a very 2016 moment there, right? A feeling like a foreigner in your own society that accelerates away from you. That book actually came out in 1970, mm -hmm. right? And so it really helped me think about, wow, this is like, we are 50 years into that particular change. Um, and so where I'm looking at is, well, we either need to slow down the pace of technological change, which I think, for example, GDPR does, the EU data privacy regulation, or we need, or, and or we need to increase our, our adaptation. So I'll just put that out there as, as kind of a framing comment, because it, um, it was really interesting for me to, to read across this and see this is um, uh, not a new trend. It's just becoming more and more and more um, that we are caught up in it. Yeah, one thing I always, uh, which is interesting, uh, there's a company, Cyber Reason, that came out with a, a wargaming exercise. I mean, a lot of these companies do wargaming exercises, and uh, they looked at attacking the U.S. election infrastructure. Uh, and the result was there's a whole host of different ways to do that, but it takes as little as $3 million to do so. So it, it doesn't take, you know, these aren't any ideas for the audience, but it doesn't take that much to, to, to hack an election. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's an interesting aspect of it. I mean, so Brett or the ambassador, are there any I thoughts think, on? Yeah. Well, I, I think, um, and uh, I, I can't tell you the name, but we were on a, a session a, a few days ago with a, a gentleman who's, uh, a well-known national security figure, uh, both in the military and then well after the military and uh, worked with multiple administrations. And one of the things I asked him was, was uh, with this current level of, of partisan politics, are we ever going to get to where we can develop a national strategy, for instance, that everybody's behind, like how we dealt with the Cold War, right? There were, there were political differences, but in general, we were all kind of going the same direction. And sadly, he said, he sees no hope for getting out of the current conundrum. So if you take that to the elections, then to me, um, whether it's mail or it's electronic, to your point, Tom, there's already a ton of ways to influence it, right? And even if we didn't have this pandemic, I don't think we would have been very well prepared to deal with the advantage of the, of the attacker, as, uh, as, um, as Jay mentioned. And, and secondly, I think the elections are very complex because it's not just the actual hack of the ballot count, it's more importantly, it's the information warfare such that when you get to the end, regardless of what the outcome is, you know, it's going to be very hard to convince the other side, whoever that is, that the results are valid. And so I think we've got some significant challenges and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how we, we handle this, this election. And um, and I've never been a proponent of, you know, the internet's too complicated. Let's just go back to using view graphs and, and carrier pigeons. But um, I'm not sure that, that we've got anything on the horizon to give people confidence on both sides of the partisan divide that the outcome cannot be challenged because of what you mentioned. Gotcha. Ambassador, any thoughts? Well, um, uh, well, it's an internal thing and I wouldn't go deep in that, but uh, what I've just got to notice is what the general said is that uh, 
it will be very difficult to have this bipartisan <laughs> approach in the US politics when it comes to certain strategic things. And from the point of us as a partner and our part of the world, uh, it's a kind of a thing which is um, making um, our partnership more difficult. That is definitely the case. I remember when we were doing uh, our NATO accession, uh, the thing which was very positive was that bipartisan uh, support we did have in Washington, D.C. That was so helpful and that um, enabled us to go through, among other things. But nowadays, as we could all see, it's um, really a challenge. And I do believe that for the Western world, for the world which is used to see U.S. as a kind of a beacon of democracy and of all the values uh, we are um, uh, fighting for and living for, it's something which is not an encouraging thing. Wow. Well, let's, let's um, end on a positive note. Um, we have three minutes left. Courtney, we, we have three minutes left. I just wanted to you know, kind of wrap it up from each of you. Um, you know, what, what do you see from the current pandemic and history and your own career that could have you know, that could teach us lessons about how we're responding to the current pandemic or any, any opportunities or, or challenges in, in the future? I know that's a, that's a meaty question. It's just free for all and, you know, a minute each, mm -hmm. please. Okay, I, I'll jump in. Yeah, I'll oh. jump in real quick. I, I, I think as, as, as both Jay and the ambassador highlighted, you know, this pandemic has created somewhat of a catalyst for us all to work together. But even with this, you can see at the state level, in, I'm, I'm talking about the nation state level, internal to the U.S., internal to other countries, we still can't get our act together to collectively decide. And I think that um, when you think about how we deal with cyberspace, the threats there, the benefits versus the risks, et cetera, uh, that uh, there's just a, a lot of challenges in terms of getting everybody to agree on on how this, uh, you know, how this domain should be should be used to the greater benefit of everybody, and so I think we have a lot of work ahead of ourselves. And uh, after 40 years of doing the same thing, I'm not sure uh, we're on track. <laughs> well, from my side as well, uh, of course. Apart from being, I don't want to be negative, but actually, <laughs> I'm very disappointing that uh, the pandemic uh, happened as such that we didn't have any other mean to respond just um, what we did like social physical distancing all these very radical measures actually the ways how it was done a century ago so that is something which is making me a kind of um, not very optimistic from the point of uh, our i would say opportunities and possibilities and capacities to have some other responses in 21st century first of all uh, having technologies, as I say, all kinds of technologies, not just ICTs, but I mean biotechnologies, everything, and that we haven't been able still to have the real treatment for the virus is something which is really making me a kind of um, very, very disappointing. But apart from that, on the positive note, uh, as General said, I'm someone who was uh, working on digital transformations for years and years and years. So the fact that it was pandemic, which showed to everyone what we were talking about, why that is so important and uh, that we need it is something which is um, making me positive for the follow up, because uh, I do believe that we would be having uh, better understanding, uh, better support and that we will be able to wrap up better this whole uh, paradigm of digital transformation better in the years to come. And Jay, that's a great point. I actually, changed my answer based on what the, those two <laughs> had said. The um, you know, my boss. I worked at the Atlantic Council think tank, and my boss there, Barry Pavel, runs the strategy program. And he said, you know, all too often in a crisis, we're just so busy scrambling, and we can't really think about the world post crisis. He says that's such a mistake, and that's what strategy is supposed to do, right? If you've got a clear strategy, then when you're in that scramble, you can be saying, all right, while I'm scrambling, I still want to be going in direction towards the goal. Um, 
And so that's what I like with the open-ending working group or, or what I was saying earlier about norms, right? If we know the norms that we want to have, those guardrails, right? Let's, we can use this moment and this opportunity, even while we're scrambling and we can hardly have enough time to breathe or think ahead. That's what the strategy is there, is to pre-think what you want to be doing so that when you're in that scramble, you know it, even a little bit of trying to move towards, further towards that goal. And so, uh, you know, and that's just not about cyber conflict. That's right. Everyone that's kind of listening and partic participating in this, think about the goals that you're aiming for, the strategy, whether those personal for you or for your organization, and how we can use this moment, this scramble, to try and still advance so that when we're coming out of this, we're so much better positioned um, than we were going in uh, to make the world a better place. Wonderful. Yeah, I guess it goes to the only probably history quote I know is from Lenin. And there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where a decade happens. And it seems like that is the case here. Uh, I, I guess it's even, it's happening even faster in the cyberspace world. Um, it has come upon one o'clock, so I'll hand it over to Courtney. Thank you so much. It was an extraordinary panel. I wish we had more time. Um, but thank you so much for every, every, all the, uh, the comments. Yeah, th th thank you. Thank you, Tom, for leading a very thoughtful discussion. And thank you, Ambassador General Jay. Uh, this was a really terrific discussion. I think it was probably the first time I've actually gotten goosebumps listening to a talk, um, because I think when I came into it, I was thinking about this panel discussion solely in the, um, just on the topic of cyber conflict in kind of a narrow way. But, but, but you know, I think you all uncovered just how, 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 fundamentally transformative the internet space is for for humanity and um and what a critical moment we're at and how it really does require this uh th this collective effort um in a way that i don't think we've we've seen before and so it really is um you know, very, very philosophical in a way so so thank you thank you all for for doing what you're doing and taking leadership in in a really um, extraordinary space and time um, with that, I am going to stop talking. Um, we, I apologize to everyone that asked a question and did not get it answered. Uh, we do have a couple of briefings coming up really quickly. We have one on Thursday, a slight time change. It'll be at 11 in the morning, and that's with Bert uh, Grusman of the Environmental Defense Fund on whether the uh, economic recovery from COVID-19, from the impacts of COVID-19 will be green or gray. So basically what what, what we can look for in terms of um, the impact on the environment. And uh, the following week on Thursday, uh, and I need to double check the time. Uh, I believe it will be nine in the morning uh, because our guest uh, speaker is coming from Singapore and that's uh, Parag Khanna on um, the post COVID-19 world order. So we're taking another stab at that too. Um, so please, these conference, uh, these calls are free and open to all around the world. So please do share them. Um, I think it's great that we can really generate a good conversation. So um, with that, thank you again to Tom. Thank you to our panelists. You've been terrific. And thank you to all who listened in today. Have a great thank day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.